Hey. Hey, Stan. How's it going? <laughs> It's going okay. Yeah. I think we're live. I think we are too. Wow, that's, so, that's, a, that's a success. <laughs> so I guess we should tell everybody our actual names. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm Nina Kachadorian. I'm Lisa Liu. And uh, we are collectively known as the Stans because we make music together as the Stans. Uh, maybe during our conversation, we'll tell you how that nickname came about. But um, we are joining you today uh, from two completely different places. I am in Berlin, Germany. And uh, where are you, Lisa? I'm in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And uh, we thought we would talk today a little bit about collaboration in general, and then maybe also specifically how we've been collaborating, and also the situation of uh, people collaborating across disciplines, because I'm a visual artist by profession and by training, but music has been a part of my life for a really long time. And um, when I met Lisa at a residency uh, a year and a half ago, which we will also tell you about, uh, we began making music together. And uh, I found out that I'm not the only non-musician who Lisa makes music with. She works with a lot of people who, like me, have a practice that straddles many kinds of things. So I'm hoping you'll say a bit about your other collaborations too. Sure, 100%. All right. Um, so maybe a good place to start our story is to talk a little bit about uh, where we met because there's kind of an interesting artistic connection to this. And I'm, I'm staring off to the side because I'm <coughs> pulling up a PowerPoint uh, so that I can show you. Now I'm gonna move my phone for a moment. I'm gonna show you a picture of Florida. And here, there, uh, is a teeny tiny island called Captiva. And Captiva Island is where the artist Robert Rauschenberg, um, <laughs> Lisa, it looks like you're having a live Instagram chat with Bob. It's really sweet. <laughs> um, hey, Bob. <laughs> how are you, Lisa? Um, <laughs> Thanks for coming to Captiva. Um, we have a lot of thanks, in fact, to give to Bob Rauschenberg for, um, for both of us getting to be on Captiva because this was the place where he spent um, a, a number of uh, decades of his life. He came down there in 1970, having kind of burnt out on, um, on living in New York and, and wanting to get away and, and moved down to this, this tiny island where it really became his home and his studio for... For, uh, until he died. And so back to the slideshow. Um, there were um, amazing, um, there's amazing nature there. There are amazing houses there. And um, he willed his entire um, place on Captiva to artists to, so that it could become an artist colony and artists could spend time there. And we were extremely fortunate to get to go and spend six weeks there in November, December of 2019. 18. Uh, 18, sorry. No. <laughs> 18. 18. No. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. No. Yes. That's crazy. You're right. <laughs> It became 2019. Okay. Thank you right. for that correction, Stan. No worries. Um, so um, I was just showing you, yeah, a couple shots from what it looks like there. But, but um, Lisa, do you want to add anything about the, the Rauschenberg thing in general? And I think you kind of summed it up really well. You know, there were nine of us and uh, it was it was all across disciplines. You know, there was a couple of painters, a photographer, a dancer, two musicians, um, a writer. And, you know, Bob really, uh, he was a huge collaborator and he wanted to have that kind of mixing happen. And, you know, I, my... My MO going to the residency was to finish my, my gypsy jazz record. And, you know, it took me about two weeks to get it done. And, you know, we had this mutual friend, Heather Wagner, but I didn't know who you were. And it was just kind of like, oh, once, you know, Nina's going to be down there. She's a great artist. Why don't you think about collaborating with her? And by the end of about like a week and a half of me finishing my record, I, you know, I played all my notes And I was just like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's, you know, why not? Why don't, why don't we just try to collaborate on something? And then what turned out to be 
um, you know, one or two songs turned out into this kind of creative spark. And we like wrote and wrote and wrote and finished 10 songs. And like there's some, four weeks. There's, four weeks. <laughs> yeah. there, there's some questions in the chat about what was the yeah. residency called. The residency was called the Rauschenberg Residency. And um, it is an invitational residency. So you, you are invited to come. Um, I got this invitation to come four years before I actually managed to do it because of my teaching schedule, um, because of all kinds of other things that were in the way. And so um, it was an incredibly nice thing to actually finally get there when I finally got there. Um, and as Lisa said, that we were a group of nine people across very different disciplines. And, and Rauschenberg himself, as many of you probably know, was a great collaborator and worked with so many different kinds of people um, through, his, through his artistic life. And we were encouraged to do the same. So there was a sort of spirit at the place of um, see what happens if you guys work together. So one day I got this text from Lisa saying, hey, I've sort of finished my record project that I came here and had on the front burner needed to finish first, but do you feel like making something? And I thought, that would be great. I'm an artist, she's a musician, I also make music, but I thought, you know, she'll take the lead on the music, I'll do something visual and we'll put something together. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow now to show you something. Um, so, let's see, okay, hang on. I'm zooming ahead a little bit. Okay, here. So, this turned out to be a very important object, <laughs> Coastal Angler Magazine, the free publication that appeared in all the Captiva, you know, little knickknack shops and tourist, tourist, um, yeah, where you could buy, you know, cheap bathing suits and shorts and stuff. And um, I didn't really know what I was going to do when I got to the residency. I just kind of went and I thought, I'll figure it out when I get there. I'll figure out where I am. And maybe there'll be some ideas that come out of that. So I was taking home these, these angling magazines and chopping them up and making collages. And, um, and I was struck by these men with fish, like these guys who, you know, here they are, like holding these big dead fish and the dudes they always look psyched and the fish always look really dead and really sad and um and i it was i couldn't kind of get it off my mind so i'm going to backtrack now a little bit um while i was chopping up fishing magazines lisa do you want to talk about what you were doing i was i was you know recording my my album you know i, I was i was deep in my k-hole just trying to trying to get my songs done and that that was the room that i stayed at you know and um and i spent most of my my first two weeks i i just kind of just spent time in my room and and just recorded and when i got tired i just took a few steps and was able to take a nap at my bed you know <laughs> so that was it, it was a really great setup but then i was also assigned a separate studio which uh, was called the garage studio and it originally was a garage and then robert rauschenberg converted it into another studio um and then, and that's primarily where uh, Nina and I got all our work done. Oh, and that's after <laughs> I got, I finished my record, you know, I, you know, it's funny, I, when we first got there, we, we kind of all just like went into our own um, spaces and didn't really socialize. So when I finished my record, I, I just drank alone on the beach. <laughs> I didn't really know anyone by that time. <laughs> Solo celebration. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not a bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so then there was this text, hey, do you want to work on something? So we ended up, um, well, I don't know. Maybe I should show them this picture. Because you had a piano in your studio. I did, yeah. You know, and funny enough, like, uh, my, my first instrument was, was play is piano. And, you know, I'm professionally known as a guitarist, but I was just really, really stoked and psyched that my, my studio had a piano and really wanted to focus and put a lot of my time to, you know, writing new songs on the piano. Prior to the residency, I hadn't played piano probably in about a year, you know, because um, I've just been so heavily in, in, in my guitar work. But, uh, you know, when I got there, I had written the song probably on the second night that I... Uh, got to the residency on the piano and I recorded on my phone and, um, you know, didn't really know what I was going to do with it. And, you know, when I, once I finished the album, that was the, the song that I sent to you to start our collaboration and the whole adventure. Yeah. And so I guess 
what happened next was that I kept thinking about these men with the fish and I kept thinking this position that they're holding these fish in, it's sort of weird. It's like a, like a seduction and it's sort of like a pieta and it's a little bit like someone cradling a baby. It was a very sort of curious mixture of, of different, different things that I saw in those pictures. And so I wrote lyrics to um, a song and it ended up being a much more kind of serious song than I set out to write. But um, we called it the Fish House Waltz and in part because there was this beautiful building. You saw a picture of it a second ago, but I'll go back to it here, which, um, which was known as the Fish House, this really amazing house on stilts and um, built in 1940 something. So the Fish House Waltz became our first song that we penned together. And, um, and I think we kind of like, I don't know, we sort of sat back and we're like, hmm, that, that was cool, let's, let's do more. And then, as you said, Lisa, we just, we kept writing and for four weeks we couldn't stop writing songs. And then by the end of this, um, I think we had like 85% of this record done, which it then took us about a year <laughs> to finish the rest of and to put the polishing final touches on it. Totally. Um, maybe it would be nice to have some live music though. And, and I think of the Fish House um, a little bit when I think of the song that I hope you'll play um, because we made a video of you playing it there. Um, but we used to also, all of us there used to, we used to spend time at the Fish House and often be there for sun, well, we weren't often there for sunrise. One of our friends was there every sunrise, but um, are you gonna play sunrise? Oh yeah. Would you play sure, sunrise? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me grab it. Okay. Maybe I'll give everybody some landscape. I don't think I've heard you play that in a super long time. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Sounded amazing. You're, you're welcome, Stan. <laughs> thanks, Stan. <laughs> Should we tell people where the Stan thing came from? Maybe everybody's wondering what the hell is this Stan business? Oh, yeah. You know, so yeah. early on, I, I had this phrase of just be like, hey, what's the plan, Stan? And then you my would response reply. would be, I don't know, Stan. So <laughs> we started calling each other Stan. And uh, 
And then there's this kind of funny thing where the T in STEM got capitalized. And that was really the function of a typo that sort of stuck, right? Yeah, but I think it looks really freaking cool. <laughs> so, sometimes, you take, sometimes you take the hints the universe gives you. There you go. So, um, um, so I, I actually thought I would ask you, Lisa, to talk a little sure. bit about... Um, a little bit about your, your musical background because you didn't start playing the kind of music that you play mostly now. And um, yeah, and maybe you could say a few words about, um, about that. Man, I mean, I've got a really diverse array of interests in, in what I studied in music. You know, I, I first started playing classical piano when I was six, you know, picked up the guitar when I was 13 and, and started learning like folk songs. And then when I moved to New York, you know, I'm originally from Southern California, I just like fell into the post-punk scene and then started playing really loud post-punk noise experimental music. You know, my favorite bands at the time and still are like Sonic Youth, Television, Slater Kinney. And, um, you know, I did that for about 15 years. And then um, probably about eight years ago, you know, I, I had kind of this grinding halt where I, I got tinnitus, you know, that's ringing of the ears. And um, that was a real shock, you know, because I, 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 I couldn't play loud music anymore, you know. You know, I got tinnitus from having like 10 years of just not having the proper ear protection. And so it took me about a year and a year and a half to kind of get my hearing back in order. Um, it was really a very, very difficult time. Uh, just to readjust to that new sensation of just hearing so many different sounds and just not being freaked out all the time. But it took me about a year and a half. And, and, and also during that time, I just kind of found my way and just realized, you know, I can still continue playing music, but it just has to be at very, at much softer volumes. And, and one day my friend came over and showed me, you know, Minor Swing by Django Reinhardt, um, a really amazing gypsy jazz guitarist. And, and that was it. I was like, oh, my God, this is this is the music that I've, I know and I've heard, you know. Um, my favorite composer when I was 15 was Debussy. So it was just like, oh, my God, I, I, I knew these harmonies. I knew the sound of, of what this music was. And then for the probably the last five years, I've just kind of dedicated myself to the art of improvisation and, and Manouche and Gypsy Jazz. And that's kind of what I do. Uh, as far as my practice goes, but you know, I also just play with a lot of different people. Um, you and then you know all all the jazz musicians that I, I play with and uh, freelance work. You know, doing stuff on Broadway and then just working with other people in folk rock or whatever whatever the job calls for. Mm -hmm. So you said yeah. something interesting to me the other day when we were talking, which is that you feel you said something like you felt that this experience of having tinnitus had sort of strangely prepared you for the trauma and the crisis of everything that's going on right now, of being sort of stuck and being stuck in a, in a confined space, which I guess the way you've talked about having tinnitus, it sounded like you were sort of stuck in your head. And now there's a different way in which maybe a lot of us are kind of stuck. Um, can you say something about, can you kind of recap what you said the other day to me? Well, you know, it's just kind of, like the the experience that I had of first the onset of tinnitus, it was just such a grinding halt. You know, all of a sudden my 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 world had shifted, um, and I, yeah, I couldn't play the music that I I was doing for the last fifteen years. And and, and in a very similar situation, you know, here in New York, we got the order to stay at home. You know, like a couple of days before, and you know. A month later, here we are, still, still sheltering in place, and and it was it, it's this this it's this forced existence of just like having to pause, and then what are you going to do? How are you going to adapt? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of hour by hour, you know. You're some days you're like, okay, I can get through this, and then other other hours you're like, oh my god, I'm losing my mind, you know. And so it's very much kind of like you know, this long haul of like, okay, how, how are we going to adapt and pivot in this time? Mm -hmm. and, and that was certainly mm -hmm. part of my journey mm -hmm. when I had to go through tinnitus as well. I've made a lot of work for a long time that um, in some ways very deliberately tries to, to work with constraints. So there was a project I started doing in 1993 called Sorted Books, 
where I go into a library and I work only with the books I find there. The library in this case could mean like a personal book collection, but the idea is to use the titles on the spines of the book to compose sentences and phrases and stories or riddles or questions or comments with. And um, one thing that's always been kind of really, that I really enjoyed about that project is that I show up with nothing and I have to just work with what's there. And there are so many limitations on, on it that um, it sort of, it sort of forces me to focus. Um, the project has that kind of inherently in it. Like I'm not, I can't bring a lot to it. I have to deal with what's there. And another project that's very much in that vein too is one that I've been making every time I've been on an airplane for the last 10 years. This is the 10 year anniversary of this project called Seed Assignment. And you know, same kind of, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> 10 years. It's certainly shown me, um, that I fly a little bit more than I probably should. That's sort of something I'm thinking a lot about these days is uh, that problem too. But, um, but there is something in that project also. And the, the basic rules are that I only work with what I've got. I have my cell phone to document with and I have whatever happens to be on the plane. And then it's just basically about improvising and, and trying to be really optimistic about what's there. Not, not writing off the situation as something which is, you know, devoid of of interest or or lacking in richness in any way but actually trying to think about it the other way around that um even here there should be something to do so you know the last few weeks for me have been a lot about figuring out how to put that into motion now if i really believe that now i'm fortunate to be in a place which hasn't been as terrifying as a lot of other places have been i mean my anxiety is mostly about you know you and my friends and people who are <laughs> far away that right. I'm worrying about. But, but, right. um, but there is something for me that, that has brought me back to this sort of methodology of working and, and thinking about limitations, which have always been something I've gotten to choose to have. And now they're sort of imposed on me. And what, what do I want to do about that? So um, I know you've been working a lot remotely with people um, and making, you know, making music with, sort of videos sent back and forth or tracks sent back and forth. And uh, we will end our conversation with um, sharing with all of you the, the one song that we've made and finished. We have other things in the pipe, but the one song we made and finished during the pandemic has been a jingle for a UN uh, contest to spread information uh, about uh, how to maintain good hygiene. <laughs> so anyway. We'll, we'll get to that by the end. <laughs> we'll get to that by the end. <laughs> um, so let's see. We sort of lost the, the, the storytelling thread of the Rauschenberg experience. Um, is there anything else you want to say about that before we? No, I mean, it's kind of, I, 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 I kind of just echoing what you, you were saying, you know, after I, I, I finished my record, kind of, that was my goal. And I was just kind of like, all right, let's just see what happens, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, you know, really just kind of was open to the idea of collaboration, you know, and kind of echoing what you were saying before about, you know, in this time, I, I have to pivot, you know, I, the, I'm a musician, what do I do? I make sound waves, I share air, you know, the very thing that we're not supposed to do right now. And mm. It's just like, okay, how can I stay connected? And, and pivot in this time mm -hmm. um and you know it's it's definitely difficult but I, i'm trying to make a concerted effort of just like all right using the technology and you know i'm the kind of musician who can also write and play rather than just being a live performers performer uh performer that you know i'm just i'm still trying to trying to stay connected in that way but it's certainly yeah, very difficult and, and super depressing sometimes. But. Well, let's go back to Rauschenberg for a moment where it wasn't depressing yeah. or difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I would say I would say that yeah. I've been struck by actually how much, um, you know, if, if there's sort of something about my practice and yours, too, in a way, like sort of yeah. responding to the stuff around us. But, um, yeah. you know, the stuff that was around us then I'm going to go back to the slideshow for a second. Yeah, um, sure. You know, there were these sort of landscapes we kept finding. I mean, this 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 surprisingly became the the tiny Captiva Chapel by the Sea, <laughs> which is the old island schoolhouse, um, became a surprisingly um, 
inspirational <laughs> spot for us because we we decided spontaneously to go um, with a couple of the other residents to uh, to a, a Sunday church service in order to sing carols because we just or sorry hymns because we just thought it'd be fun to sing in this little church with people, and then we got friendly with the. Um, Oh, oh, yeah. And we got to see a baptism in a giant clam. They dipped the baby in this shell, which was hilarious. Um, this was the Reverend John Cedarleaf, who was a really lovely man, a really fascinating person, actually, and someone who I've involved in an art project since Captiva. Um, but, you know, the, the, the things that we encountered all around the island. I mean, this is the, the Captiva Chapel's graveyard. And um, we ended up writing a song about the chapel, which, which references these many, many, many children buried in this graveyard who died in infancy or at a very young age. Um, uh, one of the songs we wrote was about this seagull that I ended up seeing on the beach one day, like in this kind of, you know, flat on the sand like really looked like it had died and this mom and her kid were standing over it and I said is the bird dead and they said no it's really sick and it turned out it had been poisoned by red tide so I took the bird in a towel and ran back all the way back up the beach to where the houses were where we were staying and found help and the bird went to the bird hospital and a week later the bird was better and was freed on the beach so it was a really happy ending for the bird um, so that was another kind of you know a, a sort of story that happened um, based, you know, a song that we wrote based on things that happened around us. We wrote a song about these little lizards that were everywhere. One of them got stuck in the printer. It was horrible. Uh, I couldn't handle it. So Lisa had to take it out and uh, dispose of it in the bushes. <laughs> was, I, I, oh, I owe man. you. I owe you for that. That was awful. Me, you owe me a lot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, picked up a picked up a free magazine from the local public library, and there was an interesting um, hurricane survivor guide in that. And mm -hmm. there was also a list of all the named storms that had hit Florida the year before. And it had never really occurred to me um, how terrifying it would be to to be in a hurricane. I mean, I I grew up in California. Earthquakes, those are normal. Um, but not hurricanes. And, and so we ended up writing a song called Cyclones, which uh, is based on a sort of repetition of the names that are the names of these storms. And do you want to talk about where the music came from for that? Yeah, I mean, we, we went to church. <laughs> we, went to the, we went to Cap Fiva, Chapel by the Sea. And there was this amazing organist, Lynn Dugan, who played this, this prelude. And it turned out to be uh, this this 15th century French hymn and it was just really beautiful and uh afterwards you know we went up to her and I had asked hey what was what was that you played and she was like oh that, this is this hymn called Picardy and I was like I would love to have the sheet music if you you know a copy of it and she's like let me dig it out of the trash you know she had just <laughs> thrown it away and and she gave it she t she dug it out of the trash and gave it to me, and I and I brought it back to my to my studio and just kind of looked at the music, and it was this really beautiful melody, and so um, just kind of adapted this melody into into what would become our song Cyclones. Um, we will just show you for a second. <laughs> This is the cover of the record that resulted in the end. Um, and yeah, maybe we'll stop the sort of record storytelling there, but, um, and sort of shift the conversation to maybe more generally to collaboration. But um, I don't even know if I've told you, Lisa, the very first collaboration I ever did, like a really important one, was, was also the most large scale of anything I've ever done. Um, I was still in graduate school and my friends Mark Tribe and Stephen Matheson and I were invited to, to make a public artwork for uh, a, a college called Southwestern Community College. And this was in San Diego and Southwestern was close to the San Diego Tijuana border. There was oh, cool. an installation festival there that, that took place every two years called Insight. And um, for Insight 94, um, we were invited to sort of come and make something on the Southwestern campus. So. We were thinking a lot about this Southern California landscape of, of everybody being in cars all the time. You know, you're a fellow Californian, so you know, 
You know how that works. I've yeah. spent many years of my life in a car. <laughs> in a car. So yeah. we thought, you know, the, the uh, funny thing about this car phenomenon is that the school was like in the middle of this campus and there was a huge parking lot that went around the outside and everyone was inevitably in their cars and in the parking lot, but nobody was paying attention to that space at all. And um, we thought, you know, maybe what we should do is, is find a way to sort of activate this parking lot space, because it's such a big space and such a dead space in a way. Um, so we, we kind of concocted the scheme to organize all the cars that came to campus for one half day by color. And this was like thousands of cars, you know, and, and um, the three of us were graduate students. We, we really hadn't had much experience making much of anything. And this is where I often like to say, you know, collaboration makes you brave <laughs> because sometimes you attempt things that you would not attempt or dare to do if you were doing them on your own. And so for, for Mark and Stephen and I, it was a, a really fortunate thing that we, um, we, we had each other to sort of, you know, come, we came up with this crazy idea and then it's like, oh, you know, sure, why not try it? So we devised this elaborate scheme, which helped us organize the cars as they came into campus. And we had 50 volunteers helping us direct traffic. And I'm gonna cheat now. I hadn't planned on talking about this piece, but I'm gonna show you a picture of um, how this turned out in the end. Um, and probably the most dramatic of the uh, parking lots was the red one. It's probably my favorite one. So I'll just show you a shot of that. Oh, wow. So, you know, by the wow. middle of the day, we had this crazy situation of, of all these cars, it very intensely kind of colors, uh, wow. different colors. Here's, here's the, the white lot. Uh, the white lot was the biggest lot of all. And 17% um, oh, wow. seven, <laughs> of cars in San Diego in 1994 uh, were, were white and no one could find their car by oh the end God. of us. And this is just a shot of the whole campus to oh kind of show God, you wow. like how big this area was. So, oh um, so you know, it, it, it felt like a sort of like the biggest collaboration I've ever been part of because there really were thousands of people um, taking part in it. Uh, how long and, did it and, take you to do that? Or how long did it take you guys to finish it? To plan it or to, to do it? I mean, like once, once like all the cars came in, like how long? Did, well, how that long was sort of the interesting thing yeah. is we, we started sorting traffic at five in the morning with the 50 volunteers. And by noon, we had that situation I just showed you of these intensely colored parking lots. And wow. then in some ways, to me, perhaps the most interesting part of the piece was what happened afterwards, which we hadn't seen coming, which is that all this order gradually disordered itself. So you'd have these like, giant fields of white cars, but then gradually it would get reshuffled and randomized all over again. And um, there were a lot of like sort of unforeseen, interesting things. Another, another thing was that people don't have the same sense of color. So we had a tiny parking lot we had allocated <laughs> to be metallic raspberry, <laughs> which was this kind of weirdly popular car color at that, <laughs> at that point in time. And the, the parking director who we assigned to that particular junction of the road m interpreted metallic raspberry to be more like maroon. And so we realized at that point that Mark and Stephen and I had, had sort of calibrated our sense of color quite closely mm. to one another at that point, sure. but this person hadn't been part of all these conversations. So it's like trying to, f trying to wa match like the white of your wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah color is, is it a, is, yeah right yeah or that is it thing like where white like, linen right you know yeah or when you show someone a certain shade of orange and you say yeah, is yeah, it orange yeah. is it red and you can argue forever right, right, about right. It. anyway um so but collaborating with you has been it has been really important to me because you know i mean i had stopped making music for a long time i i hadn't really made music for a long time when i met you and you would sort you sort of had to coax me back towards it but then we also just had this very um fantastic situation of time and privacy and people cooking meals for us and you know wildly spoiled like completely non-reality sort of setting um and uh and and you know we're quite used to collaborating at a distance because i live in berlin half the year and um we tend to kind of bounce things back and forth and then when we are in the same place we we play and we compose more so maybe now would be a good time for us to whip out the jingle and um and after that perhaps if people have questions they can put them in the comments and we could take it from there what do you think 
Yeah, sounds like a plant stand. Okay, it's a plant stand. All right. I'm going to attempt something perhaps extremely ill-advised, but I'm going to attempt because we can't really play you a song live with vocals. It just would sound terrible, we discovered. So I'm going to attempt to lip sync it. Okay, this could be a complete disaster. Let's see what happens. Okay. Just a second. I've got to get my... I gotta get my props in order. Okay, so um, this is called It's a No-No. We wrote it last week, is that right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we wrote it last week and we wrote yeah. it to submit to the UN contest uh, for art, music, any kind of creative output that helps educate people about the, uh, the, the virus and what to do. Okay, so we, we entered the hygiene part of the contest. Okay. <laughs> okay, hang on. We talked for so long that my speaker fell asleep. Okay, wake back up. Battery 100%. Connected to Vina K. Chandelurian's MacBook. Okay, that's not part of the song. All right, here we go. Unless you wash your hands, you soap up your grubbiness. The virus has been calling this. Don't touch your face, don't rub your eyes, don't poke your cheek, don't tug your ear. Unless you wash your hands. Oh, All right. <laughs> Where did you get this? Wow. You know, you got the suds was very impressive. <laughs> I know. So you didn't see that. I've been worrying that for half an hour, the suds wow. would completely fall flat. But all right. Wow. Yeah. Bravo. Okay. Bravo. So Bravo. if you want to hear that a little bit in higher fidelity, um, you, can, you can find it on the Stan's Bandcamp site, <laughs> along with this record we keep talking about. Um, so, all right. Now we're looking at the chat bit comments thing here. Does anyone want to know anything? <laughs> about I anything. A question that was, I, there, one question popped up that was okay, really right. good. I, 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 don't, I don't see if I can find it. But it, she, I don't know who the user was, but it was, what makes, what makes for a good collaboration and how do you resolve differences? Oh, wow. Great question. Yeah. Um, hmm. Hmm. Should we talk about, we have talked about this. I mean, quite a many bit. Times. <laughs> many times. Many times. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, should we answer it about us or should we talk about other people we've worked with? Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do both. I think, we, I think we, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I will say, like, temperamentally, Lisa and I have, have, in some ways, very different ways of working and in some ways, a very compatible way of working. Um, I tend to get into the weeds a lot. I tend to, if I'm recording on my own, I tend to do like 15 or 20 takes of something like again and again and again. And, you know, initially much to my horror, Lisa was like, I'm kind of all about like two takes. And I was like, I can't work this way. You know, but, but it has been really good for me that you have kind of often pushed me to, um, to uh, let go a little bit and sort of just commit to it and do it. So... I have learned that working with you to move cool. more towards that. Awesome. Your turn. Uh, my turn. <laughs> oh gosh. I, you know, I, I think what makes for just any great collaboration, you know, I work with so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of musical situations is just to be open and to be listening all the time. Right. You know, and making sure that I'm creating enough space for whoever I'm playing with um, 
to 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 just let them have their space to to do their thing and then do it to the best of their ability right you know and and, and very much my my philosophy is just like you know the sum is greater than its parts mm -hmm. and so um you know i i think we really struck a really great balance in that way you know of mm -hmm. like of of you know, sometimes we did butt heads and be like, all right, this is what I want. And you're like, no, and then uh, vice versa. <laughs> but I, yeah. but I, I think ultimately we came to agree of just like, what is the best idea? What is the best way to mm -hmm. do things? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think that's, um, you know, there's, there's a certain kind of diplomacy and, and, and um, maturity that has to come along with that. So yeah, um, yeah. Mat maturity is a funny one too, in the sense that, you know, I told, I told you all the story about Car Park. You know, I was like, what was I, like 23 years old when I made that piece with my friends. And none of us were really very formed as artists yet. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. And that was a good thing. We were very malleable. We were really flexible. We were able to, um, to kind of find our way towards something that didn't have to do with the way that each of us individually worked because in a way we didn't know what that was yet. And it makes me a little bit sad sometimes that um, in some ways collaboration has gotten harder, um, maybe in an artistic realm for me, the more I've sort of gotten kind of, you know, you could say sunk into a way of working. So, um, so it can be a little hard sometimes to, to try to step outside of the things you know that you like to do a certain way. And, um, and maybe because for me, you know, music isn't the main thing I do. It's kind of a very important thing to me, but, um, but a little bit less my public face. Um, there's a bit of freedom there to kind of, to kind of, you know, stretch towards things that, that aren't my thing because my thing hasn't really been one thing in this other realm. So I mean, but you know, I can say that to, about myself as well. You know, I just, I don't play one kind of music. No, you don't. You know? Yeah. And right. I feel like our album that we made together was, you know, is a representation of that. It's, 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 you know, classical, it's jazz, it's rock, it's folk, it's rockabilly. It's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, heart wrenching, like, you know, ba piano ballad. And right. um, I, I, I think it's just kind of, what really excites me about collaboration is just an idea and if it's authentic, you know, mm -hmm, and then, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I don't know that I would have written these songs if I wasn't working with you. And I mean, I think we've said that before to each other as well. It's like this thing we made is some like third, third thing. Like it's not, it's, uh, it, it's, we said that often, I think, when these songs were being written. It's like, I've never really written anything like that. <laughs> like, whoa, this is weird. Where did that come from? So, um, yeah, do you, could you say a bit about your 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 collaboration with Cornelius Eady? Sure. You know Cornelius Eady, he's an African American poet, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet. He's amazing. He's brilliant. Uh, and I've been playing in his trio, the Cornelius Eady trio, for about four or five years now uh, with another guitarist, Charlie Rao. And um, you know, he's kind of similar in your background. He's he's not a musician by trade first, you know, he's a poet, he's, he does another artistic medium, but um, has really, loves music and has found a very authentic expression through it. And what's really exciting for me to work with somebody like Cornelius and, you know, somebody like you is this, they bring, they have a very different perspective of how they approach um, sound and, and making mm. music and making songs and, and you know, I think it's what you had kind of riffing off what you were saying before is of, you know, we, when you're working alone, you kind of get stuck into just doing things in one process in one way. And, you know, working with somebody who's not necessarily in, you know, the discipline of music all the time, you know, mm -hmm. what I do all the time, it just, it really makes me expand and think about things differently, working with different kinds of people. So a question just came up in the thread that I think it would be cool if we both tried to answer from sort of an artist and musician perspective. But uh, the question was, do you still think New York is the best place to live and work as an artist? Um, I, you know, I, I think the world is a big place. And I've for a long time sort of felt that you have to figure out, it's a very personal question, but you have to work in a place where you can work. You, ha you have to work in a place where you're able to um, 
make your work well. That isn't New York for a lot of people. I, I've seen friends kind of um, who came to New York with big dreams and kind of a lot of mythology about New York in their heads. And it turned out to be a terrible place for them to work. They, they couldn't, they couldn't deal with it. It was just like the wrong atmosphere and their work suffered from it. And then they left and their work blossomed. So, you know, I have seen that. I, I happen to like the kind of kick in the pants that New York is constantly. Um, and I also really like getting to leave. <laughs> I am very fortunate <laughs> that I don't have to be there all the time. I, 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 I'm able to split my life between places with very different um, uh, temperaments and moods and you know Berlin where I am now is a very very quiet city and I, I really need that quiet um, so you know New York's great but New York is actually not the center of the universe it actually isn't and a lot of people um, I think feel that it is and um, it's a very unique place it's a place very dear to my heart it's like no other place I've ever lived or been but there are a lot of places in this world and you got it. You really have to sort of go, um, I think to the place, which is good for your work. Word. Word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, um, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, I, you know, for me at this period of time, New York's great. You know, mm -hmm. I, when, when things prior to, to where we are right now in the lockdown, it's, um, there's just so many different kinds of people to play with, you know, yeah. in any, any kind of musical genre and everyone yeah. does it at such a high caliber that, you know, um, you know, I'm always constantly being inspired. So for me at this time, yeah, New York's, New York's the place to be, but I also, um, I tore, I tore a lot. And so right. I'm able to leave and, and to kind of have that space of just a breath of fresh air. But, um, if I didn't have that all the time, I, yeah. That, that mm -hmm. would certainly be really difficult. For sure. Yeah, I think New York's a really tough city to feel trapped in. Like it's just like it's a it's New York is never as beautiful to me as the day I'm leaving it. That's something I've sometimes thought because there's this sense of kind of like then then it feels like a, a choice to be there. Um, yeah, and of course right now uh, you know it's much on my mind. So um, oh, there are all these good questions that keep coming up in the thread and then they go away. <laughs> <laughs> they they scroll away, but um, I think we've 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 gone almost fifty minutes, and maybe we should wind it down. But if anybody wants to throw know. one more one comment, more. one more comment, we're listening, we're watching for you. Huh? Coming back to New York is also the most beautiful feeling. Yes, it is. True. This is yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I know who you are. That was one of my students giving me some crap. <laughs> Scott's also a musician, a really good one. Well, I think then we will wind it down. Um, thank you everyone for, for listening to us and participating. And um, there was a question, do we ever play live? Yes, <laughs> once we have, and we will again. But um, right now we're not in the same place. So um, if you wanna hear the record we've been talking about, you can go to our Bandcamp site and check it out. Um, I'm really, really happy to be working with Pace and that they asked us to do this. Thank you, all the folks at Pace who helped this happen. And thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Stan. Thank you. Thanks to everybody at, at Pace for, for guiding us through all the tech. And I uh, hope you guys all stay safe and healthy and see you guys soon. All right. Should we try the high five that we practiced the other day? Here we go. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>